With an estimated population of over 2,295,000 in 2020, Austin is not only the capital of Texas, but the cultural and economic center of the Austin Round Rock metropolitan area. Currently the 11th most populous city in the United States and the 4th most populous city in Texas, Austin has been one of the fastest growing large cities in the US since 2010. Thanks to the city's many musicians and live music venues, as well as the long-running PBS TV concert series Austin City Limits, Austin's a official city motto is the live music capital of the world. In 1987, the city became home to South by Southwest, an annual festival for film, interactive media, music, and conferences. In 2008, South by added comedy to its ever-expanding list of media symposiums. Though originally held for only one night, comedy performances have since 2012 occurred on all nights of the festival. In 2011, the Paramount and Stateside Theaters, in conjunction with the Cap City Comedy Club, kicked off the annual Moon Tower Comedy Festival. And in 2022, Moon Tower established a partnership with Canada's Just for Laughs. The history of comedy in Austin is still being written. In 2020, podcast host and sometime comedian Joe Rogan relocated his media presence to Austin. In his wake came some of the genre's biggest names who decided to leave Los Angeles and New York for comedy and entertainment's new third coast. During the pandemic, Rebecca Trent, owner and operator of New York's The Creek in the Cave, closed up shop in the Big Apple and relocated to downtown Austin. During South by 2023, Joe Rogan opened his comedy mothership in the historic Ritz Theater on 320 East 6th Street. The city's unofficial local motto, Keep Austin Weird, has been featured on everything from bumper stickers to t-shirts. It promotes Austin's eccentricity and diversity, and bolsters support of local independent businesses. With all the comedy business at hand, the time is right to keep Austin fun. <laughs> The oldest joke on record came from a Sumerian cuneiform tablet from around 3100 to 2900 BCE. The apparently timeless joke was, of course, about passing gas, intimate relations, and marriage. The history of comedy in the modern era in Austin begins with... Vaudeville. Vaudeville was conceived from a variety of popular forms of entertainment, including the concert saloon, minstrel shows, circus freak shows, and American burlesque. I love the vaudeville era. It was um, the, one of the premier places where uh, comedy was performed, other than silent film comedy. But vaudeville was a marvelous live medium of, perform of variety performance in uh, theaters large and small, in major cities and smaller towns. Um, comedy was one of its uh, largest and most successful forms. Um, uh, the great thing about vaudeville is you had room to fail. You developed a perf and perfected a 15 to 16 minute act, whether you had a performing dogs or a, a brief dramatic skit, sang a couple of songs or danced a little bit or all of them together. Comedians were the backbone of vaudeville. Comedians were the glue that held vaudeville together. Um, the variety was so extreme. It was like everything all the time. As I said, animal acts, singers, dancers, um, comedians could morph into masters of ceremonies that could bring the very disparate acts together for an evening of enjoyment to introduce each act. Some comedians started interacting with the various acts to joke with the singer or joke with the person with the, with the performing dogs. February of 1915, a new vaudeville theater began construction at 713 Congress Avenue. Conceived by Austin native Ernest Knoll and designed by John Everson, this state-of-the-art venue would be a bright star in the interstate vaudeville circuit. On October 11th, 1915, the Majestic Theater, as it was known then, opened its doors, selling 1,000 seats, most of which were only 25 cents a ticket. The new theater attracted top national and international talent like world-famous magician Harry Houdini as well as stage and film legends the Marx Brothers to Austin, and elevated the city's burgeoning cultural footprint. On November 2nd, 1920, the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in Pittsburgh launched the first commercial radio broadcast under the callsign KDKA to broadcast the live returns of the Harding-Cox presidential election. Within just four years after the initial KDKA broadcast, 600 stations existed in the United States. Broadcast radio was being invented, and as the Great Depression hit, vaudeville was just too expensive to maintain as a, a viable um, performance 
um, medium. At the same time, radio was growing, and so many vaudeville performers, especially the comedians, found themselves uh, moving over to the radio uh, medium in the early 1930s. The emerging technology of radio radically changed the way people would enjoy entertainment. Radio presented many new problems for uh, comedians because it used that 15 minutes of perfected uh, skit in one performance. And yet a radio needed to be daily, weekly, monthly. Um, perform you need to, to have an unlimited um, uh, stash of comedy to be able to succeed on radio. And so many, vaudeville many vaudevillians burnt out within a matter of weeks and months. South and Central Texas got its first high-powered station in 1922. WOAI in San Antonio went on the air on September 25th, 1922. On February 6th, 1928, WOAI joined the world's first network, the National Broadcasting Company, which eventually became the TV network NBC. Comedy programs were some of the most popular offerings on the network. The early days of radio were flooded with comedians, including shows like Amos and Andy, The Bob Hope Show, and The Jack Benny Program. It's to Jack Benny's credit that um, he and his uh, partner writer, Harry Kahn, figured out a way of dealing with that enormous maw of need of radio by creating characters, um, basically creating a sketch that was putting on a radio show. And so instead of just giving his 15 minutes of perfected monologue, he entered into dialogue with the other people around the radio microphones. Um, and so uh, that uh, created new kinds of comedy. There hadn't been that kind of comedy in Vaudeville, but um, it was, again, tremendously popular in the new medium. And radio was the top place to, for comic performers uh, in the 1930s and 1940s. Radio came to Austin in 1921, courtesy of the physics department at the University of Texas, when one of the earliest licenses was issued to the university on March 22nd of that year. The call letters were initially 5XY. A new license was issued in 1922 with the call letters WCM. And on October 30th, 1925, a new license was issued with the call letters KUT. The radio revolution that began in Pittsburgh in 1920 had, by 1931, infiltrated a majority of U.S. households. Most Americans owned at least one radio receiver. The golden age of American radio was a nail in the coffin for vaudeville. And from the 1930s through the 40s, commercial broadcast radio permeated the fabric of American daily life by providing news and entertainment to a country struggling through economic depression and war. Little did they know that the next big thing was right around the corner. Radio had a huge problem in that um, it was so con its sponsors kept it so conservative that the major radio performers, most of them had been on the air 20 years. It was nearly impossible for new talent to break into the world of broadcast radio. The first TV station in Austin was KTBC, which aired its first broadcast on Thursday, November 27, 1952. The first television station in Austin and Central Texas was originally housed in a small studio in the Driscoll Hotel. The station was originally owned by the Texas Broadcasting Company and then by future U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson and his wife Lady Bird. KTBC carried all major networks at the time, ABC, CBS, and NBC. However, it was a primary CBS affiliate. It carried roughly 65% of CBS's schedule, while NBC and ABC split the remaining coverage in half. So um, then when television comes along, starting in the late 40s into the early 50s, um, television programmers claimed to want a different kind of comedy. Radio comedy they thought was kind of slow and kind of soft. What they wanted in television comedy was something more like Sid Caesar or Martin and Lewis. They want Milton Berle. They wanted loud, fast, jump up and down kind of slapstick comedy um, to go with those tiny television screens. It was difficult for a number of radio um, comedians to make that switch. Um, but early television, being um, based in New York City, 
with the small screens and uh, was a terrific space for those club comedians, for the Catskills comedians, for New York-based comedians, because most of um, stable radio comedy had moved out to the West Coast, was Hollywood-based. So with early television um, uh, centering in New York, it allowed um, that a new generation of comedians to come up uh, because they weren't the old-fashioned radio comedians. So there was this spark of newness. Progress spurs change. By 1955, a majority of U.S. households owned at least one television set. The kids that grew up with radio wanted a bit more edge to their TV. Teenagers and college students in the late 50s and early 60s craved programming that pushed the limits of what their parents considered acceptable family entertainment. Different media had different standards and different rules and different kinds of censorship. Um, a, a radio was highly censored because of its sponsors, didn't want to uh, have anything negative in any way, anything controversial as, uh, associated with the uh, advertisements for their products. Television, too, um, uh, on the one hand, it had the sort of New York chic liveness to it, but it was also tremendously censored. And comedians who had come up in, in private clubs in, in um, um, it was Harlem and, um, you know, sort of New York nightlife where um, it was cool to be edgy, where to be different you could speak about sort of verboten topics and things that were, were different from uh, uh, broadcasting. Uh, indeed did have to have a number of different acts. New technology often comes with the same old problems. Television, like radio, needed sponsors and advertisers to pay for production. Audiences had an insatiable need for content, but the conservative standards of the era meant that broadcasters had to be careful not to offend listeners and viewers. More importantly, they needed to walk a very fine line with the folks that controlled the purse strings. It's a, um, a changing of cultural standards uh, of the 1960s of, on the one hand, uh, uh, the height of Playboy magazine culture, where to be a sophisticated urban uh, young man, uh, professional man, or part of a couple, which means your um, uh, sort of li newly liberal attitudes toward sex and obscenity and, and things like that. Um, brought audiences to some of these supper clubs or other places where comedians were performing blue, more blue comedy. Um, the younger generation that said we're tired of, of uptight grandparent comedy and um, some of them connected it to uh, politics, that they wanted to be more open in criticizing forms of authority and they thought that um, uh, uh, talking more authentically about everything from bodily functions to sex um, made them better comedians. Uh, so for it's pushing the edges of the envelope in various ways for, for various purposes. In 1948, Jack Kerouac introduced the phrase Beat Generation, describing his social circle of underground anti-conformist youth gathering in New York at the time. The Beat movement was countercultural and anti-materialistic and stressed the importance of bettering one's inner self over material possessions. Hot on the heels of beatniks were hippies. Another countercultural youth movement that began in the United States during the mid-1960s, hippies adopted a tradition of cultural descent from bohemians and beatniks of the beat generation in the late 1950s. There's a sea change in the 1960s, starting in the late 50s with beatnik culture, beat culture. Um, uh, this idea among especially uh, younger intellectuals, younger comics, younger performers, that, um, again, it's all about authenticity, that they wanted to discuss the problems of the world. They wanted to uh, un uncover, uh, you know, prejudice. They, you know, they're, they're in, uh, trying to support the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the young people's movement, the critique of the war, the critique of accepting authority, um, the critique of consumerism. And so um, they're breaking it. It's happening everywhere in music, in comedy, in drama. Um, in, in college students on campuses wanting to, you know, um, join movements and, and do things. So I think there's both give from the performers as well as push from the audiences that they're flocking, you know, uh, young audiences are, are flocking to uh, encourage uh, uh, performers who are willing to 
push those edges of the envelopes of, of not being polite anymore, of, of willing to be offensive. Tom and Dick Smothers, known professionally as the Smothers Brothers, appeared frequently on television variety shows and released several popular comedy albums of their stage performances in the late 1950s and early 60s. Their television variety show, The Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, became one of the most controversial American TV programs of the Vietnam War era. There's a marvelous documentary about the Smothers Brothers, how that sort of, I, that I absolutely love, about how they were just you know, little folk singers, but they became more sort of woke, if you will, about um, unhappy to see how the administration was continuing to uh, enlarge the scope of the conflict in Vietnam. And so they're trying in their in sort of a quiet way, they're, they're, you know, uh, to, uh, to criticize it. And they're increasingly getting more and more and more pushback from their network, CBS. In a way, they get forced off the air by like 1968-69, but then laughing comes in just a year later and can make all the same Nixon and war jokes and be celebrated. So it's a, it's a mixed up time of, of some people able to push their voices uh, out further, others very unjustly bearing the brunt of, of censorship like Lenny Bruce over and over and over again. Um, so it, it's um, a time of, uh, of, of many different voices trying to talk about change in the world, um, and hooray that comedy was among them. The restrictive nature of television gave rise to comedy clubs nationwide. Comedians like George Carlin and Richard Pryor played it safe on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and let it rip on stages all around the country. Well, the clubs I think of as being based more on the coast and in Chicago and maybe in Florida. So where, where you know, the kind of mad men you know, admin, the, the the tired business guy in a business suit in what we would consider today the blue states were the homes of some of the first comedy clubs. Um, there was another sort of ring of clubs, uh, of, of performance spaces that were college-based. So um, Bob Newhart did sort of more college tours, uh, whereas sort of some of the Lenny Bruce's and, and some of the um, comics who appeared on, say, Ed Sullivan, a great way to break into mainstream media, or then like the Johnny Carson show. Um, th then, you know, you were uh, moving from the clubs to get a, um, a, a, a spot on one of those shows. Back in the day, m many comics then wanted to get a TV deal. Oh, can I be on a situation comedy or something like that? Cable television began in the United States as a commercial business in 1950. Early on, cable systems served small communities without television stations of their own that couldn't easily receive signals from stations in cities. Cable TV came to Austin in the summer of 1963. TV Cable of Austin, as it was known then, had over 2,000 subscribers by April of 1964. In November of 1972, Time Life and Sterling Communications launched one of the first pay cable networks, HBO. In 1975, HBO premiered its first comedy special, An Evening with Robert Klein. This, alongside an anthology comedy series called On Location, created the foundation for HBO to become an important stepping stone in a rising comedian's career. Cable TV users went from 50,000 in 1974 to over 97 million in 2016. Since then, satellite, internet, and streaming entertainment have continued to chip away at the formerly huge number of cable subscribers. From Aristotle to Shakespeare to 20th century satirist Dorothy Parker to contemporary comic and filmmaker Bo Burnham, people have been spinning amusing yarns for audiences for as long as there has been one funny person and someone waiting and willing to laugh. The history of comedy is the history of humankind. There are nearly as many styles and forms of comedy as there are practitioners of the art. It is said that comedy comes in threes. This has never been more true than it is in the comedy community of Austin. Sketch, stand-up, and improv comedy dominate the clubs and theaters in the capital of Texas. Esther's Follies, located at 525 East 6th Street in downtown Austin, is a modern-day vaudeville review mixed with political commentary that is like nothing else on the national comedy scene. The group is named after legendary actress and aquatic choreographer Esther Williams. The Austin sketch troupe has been a comedy institution and a must-go theater experience for over 45 years. My husband and I met while we were at UT. We were both uh, involved in the Curtain Club Theater, 
in a show called Now the Revolution in 1969. And uh, then we got together and decided that we didn't want to leave Austin. So we just started figuring out ways we could come up with a place to work that we could run ourselves. So we started with Liberty Lunch down on 2nd Street. And then when the city kind of took over that whole area by eminent domain, we had already moved on to a little place down here on 6th Street, which was the original Esther's Follies. And it burned down uh, not very long after we were here for about three years. Then we moved up to the Ritz, which we had had for a while. And we were planning to do things there, but we decided we'd also do Esther's there because we had no other theater. We went to the Ritz for about half a year. It was very difficult because it was just so big and cold and drafty and not conducive to comedy. We got the option to get this theater, which is, uh, and they helped us do that. We had to go through banks and things, and we were not wealthy at the time. We had no, no, no ability to pay for huge amounts of things. So we got a deal going, and we were able to, uh, to buy the building with a lease purchase kind of situation. So it took us a year, but then we finally owned this building. We decided Austin was the best place, really, to be. I mean, obviously bigger cities like Dallas and Houston have their good things, but they were not the hotbed of, of activity and fun and, and creativity that Austin was. So first we wanted to stay here. It was an immediate uh, success. I mean, the word of mouth became huge and we had huge houses. We, I think we held about 200 in our space at that time, and we we were packed constantly. It would be like uh, kind of like a Saturday Night Live kind of show, but or maybe like your show of shows, if you go back that far. One of those kind of shows that involves music and comedy and making fun of political comedy. Our, our ability to do things about the political scene has always been able to be helped by the fact that the politics have been crazy in, in the United States. We had a great time with Trump. We had a great time with Clinton. We had a good time with Reagan. You know, there were just, there's always been people that we can make fun of. Now, we try to do a balance so that we're not always putting down the Republicans. But unfortunately, lately anyway, the Republicans tend to make more funny stuff. <laughs> in the beginnings, the Texas state legislature just was basically a um, a rubber stamp for whatever they wanted to do, the good old boys of Texas. So there weren't too many great things that we could glom onto. We've always aimed towards uh, a national audience. When Ann Richards was running for governor, we were approached by uh, Liz Carpenter to get on a bus and go walk, go around to little towns in Texas and, um, and do a little spiel for Ann. So my piano lady at the time, Leova Rosanoff, and I got on these buses and went to, you know, all every little small town and pulled up in their, in their central square and, and, uh, and sang about three songs. And then somebody spoke, usually Anne's mother or father or somebody like that. And one time when we went to a, a college station, it was, uh, it was Carol Channing who showed up and sang Diamonds are a girl's best friend and handed out little fake diamonds and things like that. So it was a lot of fun. Well, I'd say the most most important thing that Austin has is an incredible audience. They are just so giving. And, I mean, literally, you'll get standing ovations where you would never do that anywhere else. It's just they're very giving. They're very uh, ready to be laughing at themselves. They don't mind laughing at others, too, but they will laugh at themselves. At least that was the case prior to Trump. Unfortunately, we had some pretty angry people. Well, we have pretty much feel we feel safe to the extent that uh, we don't think that we'll ever have somebody come in and shoot us or anything like that. Although Sixth Street has certainly had some shootings, but it's mostly at three a.m. Comedy has been a big part of Austin since when we got here in '77, and then many other improv troops and. Um, and stand-up clubs have done well. Cap City, of course, has been doing well and is coming back. They've got a new space that's out in the domain, which is perfect because it's a whole world of people, you know, college age and just beyond college age, that all work out there. And, of course, they love to laugh, too. So. 
Originally launched as The Laugh Stop in 1986, located at 8120 Research Boulevard, the Capital City Comedy Club served as a second home to legendary groundbreaking Texas comics Bill Hicks and Ron White. Cap City is a key sponsor of the Moon Tower Comedy Festival and home to the Funniest Person in Austin contest, now in its 38th year. In September of 2020, Cap City closed for good in its original location but reopened in July of 2022 in its new home at the Domain. At the time, I was a young Florida comedy club manager in West Palm Beach. We started scouting in Austin. We would do like a night in Austin, a night in Dallas, a night in Houston, and then come right back to Austin because the scene was so already vibrant. And I think that has always been the magical thing about comedians in Austin. It's super, there's a huge community. Everyone is super supportive of each other. New ideas. Cap City was the real comedy club. It was the last stop then. It went up for sale. Somebody, uh, people from San Antonio bought it. They redesigned the room. It came up for sale. Myself, my husband, Margie Coyle, who had been the manager there from day one, her husband, and a guy named Rich Miller, Dennis Miller's brother, and his wife, we all went in together and bought the club. The club was totally happening until March of 2019. It was like the hottest spot in Austin for stand-up, and FPIA, funniest person in Austin, had been running for many, many years. I think almost 30 years at that point. Uh, but yeah, we had no choice but to just, we had to shut it down. Through our years at Cap City, Mark Grossman, who started the wonderful Helium Comedy Club in Philadelphia, and one of our partners actually worked for him as a talent consultant. So we all kind of got into business together. Everyone wanted to get out. Mark was the one who came forward to say, like, let's reopen Cap in Austin, but in a different location, like out of that uh, plaza that it was in. The domain was really young when we were, you know, the domain has grown tremendously. Mark is the one who spearheaded it. One of the, you know, the, the mainstay of Cap City was growing local comics. We had a policy that we would mostly, unless it was really enforced on us, the headliners that came in had to use local comedians to open and feature. Growing local talent was always in our DNA like we that was like a main thing it's because also the audiences in Austin really support their local people. Every single comic wants to play Austin. Ron White, I mean, it's like he's a Texas guy, mostly Dallas, but lives in Austin and has had some of his most memorable shows in Austin. I actually, in his last year of life, managed Bill Hicks and he was a very, very good friend of mine. And Austin was always his favorite stuff to try out material as he traveled the world. Yeah, Austin was like his second home. He lived in New York and L.A., but Austin is always where he most preferred doing comedy. For comedy, and this is what I've always loved about it, there is something for everyone. You don't like this week's act? You love next week's act that we're bringing in or, or presenting. Comedy is a wonderful unifying thing. The simplest rules of improv include saying yes and, always adding new information, don't block someone else, avoid asking questions, and playing in the present by using the moment. The rules of improv in Austin, however, are there are no rules! From the Fallout Theater to the Cold Town Theater to the Hideout Theater, there is no end to quality improvisational comedy available in the capital of Texas. We were both improvisers at the theater, um, and uh, I had already started the children's program by renting from the previous owner. So I rented the space for the classes and for the shows. Um, and then uh, I heard that they were interested in taking over, or I heard that Roy was interested in taking over the theater, and I was like, I would also be interested in that, that yeah. sounds good. And, um, and then I found out that Kareem was involved, and I was like, okay, sounds good. <laughs> uh, and we all met at a Mediterranean food place, yeah, I believe, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and decided that it would, be, it would be good, yeah. And it was nice because I had already kind of started the children's program on a very minor level, and of course, having full access to the place rather than renting it uh, gave me the ability to really expand it, which was great. At the time, I mean, we knew Jessica from performing a little bit with her, but we, had, we weren't super close. Um, and, you know, she had this plan and was already putting into action a youth program. We're like, well, that'd be good to have at the theater. That makes sense. And neither, uh, 
neither I nor the other owner really had any any experience with with running that or teaching kids uh, at that point. So it was like, well, it was a good, it was a perfect fit, and just from a pure business perspective. Um, yeah, makes sense. High Down has always been here. Uh, I mean, this building has been here for about 140 or 150 years, but the hideout uh, as a theater coffee house has always been in the spot uh, for going on 24 years. So so this building predates the, the Paramount, oddly enough. Not as a theater, but the building itself has been here for at least 140 years. The hideout is not run specifically to make a lot of profit. <laughs> um, that was like one of the things that we agreed on when we got together was that profit is not maybe our number one consideration. So for me, I really like it when it's just normal business. Um, I feel like we're able to be more artistically adventurous and, um, and push some boundaries. People who are like, we're just trying to get people in, then, uh, then there's a tendency to want to go for like, oh, we'll do the thing that's safe. And I don't like safe theater. Um, so improv specifically, I feel like uh, Austin's improv scene is a lot tighter knit. We all know each other, like all, all the theaters and theater owners, like we know each other and, and don't necessarily like get together all the time, but like we'll swap notes occasionally. We're like, was, was your weekend weird? Was it kind of slow? And like, you know, we're all very friendly. Um, performers perform at, at different theaters and take classes at different theaters. I think Austin, because there's no it's changing a little bit because for a while there was really no industry to speak of in Austin, like no film industry. Uh, people are doing improv because they love it. They're doing it for the love of getting on stage and, and, and performing rather than like hoping there's someone in the audience who's going to cast them in a thing. I would say that the difference here is that uh, people tend to be really, really supportive and I don't know if you've done a lot of theater in other places or any place, but there's kind of this like intensity about it and everybody's like, really really driven and and everything is the most you would say drama people tend to be a little dramatic sometimes um, but i'd say here in austin people are um it's not that there's not driven it's that that there's also this layer of uh and quality of kindness uh, with it that i found and i feel like in austin people are generous to each other um, in ways that are really nice, but there's sort of a quality here that it's interwoven together. Um, whereas maybe in some places people are sort of nice in spite of, you know, the, the traditions or, or the way that you have to be in order to get ahead in comedy. Whereas here in Austin, it feels like it's all interwoven and, and being successful. Part of being successful is, um, being supportive of the community that's around you. Um, we go out of our way to have a really strong relationship with the other improv theaters. So the Fallout, the Cold Town, and Merlin Works are all like, we're good friends, we talk, uh, we perform at each other's theaters, that kind of stuff. Um, we occasionally check in with each other just to you know, make sure everything's good. So that, uh, the improv theaters for sure. We don't do as much uh, with the other theaters. Um, there is a little bit of overlap, like some improvisers will go and do stuff at Esther's, you know, and that's really cool. There's a lot of improvisers who also do stand up. And so we kind of know of that world a little bit, but as far as like the theater owners, uh, we don't we don't reach out that much, which now I'm like, huh, maybe we should. The audiences are great. They, uh, the, the Austin audiences tend to be pretty game for whatever you're doing. I mean, obviously you can't just get up and do a terrible show and they're not gonna, they're, it's not like they're easy marks, but like they are, they're willing to let you get a little weird and do things that are experimental and like come along for the ride. Audiences in Austin don't like uh, people belittling or being mean to other people as much. So like if you go see stand up, um, and I kind of forgot that this happened in other places, but I've, I've seen um, outsiders come here and try to do the same stand up that would work really well elsewhere. Or I guess it works well elsewhere. Um, but here, audiences just kind of get quiet when they say things that maybe are like judgmental of people because of their race or judgmental of people because of their gender or whatever. Uh, people in Austin are just kind of like, mm. Not my thing as much. Geometry 101 tells us that any three points not on a line define a plane. Schoolhouse Rock told us that three is a magic number. With a three-legged table, if one leg is off, the whole thing falls down. In Austin, the three pillars keeping comedy stable are found at Esther's Follies, Cap City Comedy, and the cooperative network of hardworking improv theaters all over town. If comedy comes in threes, then Austin must be the funniest place on earth.
In Austin, it's remarkably easy to make a bad habit out of having good fun. As Austin takes its place among the world's leading cities, its cultural and entertainment footprint continues to grow. A city where the only thing that never changes is how much the city is always changing. The U.S. Census Bureau ranks Austin first among the 50 largest U.S. metros based on net migration as a percent of the total population in 2020. Austin is already well known for its many entertainment festivals, from the ACL Music Festival to the ATX Television Festival, and from the South by Southwest Music, Film, and Interactive Media Conference to the Austin Film Festival. As an up-and-coming powerhouse for new and veteran comedy performers, Austin brings the heat to comedy festivals. Established in 2012 in conjunction with the Cap City Comedy Club, the Moon Tower Comedy Festival is still going strong. The Austin Theatre Alliance created and launched this nationally recognized annual comedy festival with headliners Wanda Sykes, Stephen Wright, Seth Meyers, Nick Offerman, Aziz Ansari, Mark Marin, and many, many others. What once began as a four-day event has now grown into a ten-day event across multiple venues in Austin. In 2008, a comedy element was added to South by Southwest, only held for one night. By 2012, comedy performances occurred on all nights of the festival. With an established history of featuring seasoned veterans and fresh-faced challengers to the throne, the South by Southwest Comedy Festival brings the next wave of trend-setting comedic talent to the entertainment industry and creative community deep in the heart of Texas. In 2021, Montreal's Just for Last organization teamed up with the Paramount to reimagine the Moon Tower Comedy Festival as Moon Tower Just for Laughs Austin. Just for Laughs was founded in 1983 and hosts the biggest comedy event in the world in Montreal. Austin joins Toronto, Vancouver, Sydney, and Bermuda as host cities for this legendary, internationally regarded comedy event. Austin may be the live music capital of the world, but musicians beware. Between the unlimited fount of local comedic talent and the siren's call of good food, great audiences, and state-of-the-art venues bringing comedy legends to our backyard, Austin is on the verge of dethroning New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago as the premier comedy destination in the country. The big question has been what makes Austin different from other larger and more established comedy meccas like New York, LA, and Chicago? The answer from the local pioneers and practitioners of sketch, stand-up, and improv comedy is that Austin genuinely cares. The audiences are enthusiastic and supportive. Industry professionals cooperate and make each other better. Where New York comedy is a jungle and LA comedy is a lion's den, Comedy in Austin is a greenhouse that nurtures and supports talent. Comedy didn't just show up to Austin in 2021 with Just for Laughs. It didn't merely arrive in 2008 when South By invited some funny folks to the podium. Great stand-up didn't simply make the scene in 2011 with Moon Tower. Cable brought comedy to Austin via HBO in 1975. TV brought sitcoms and late-night talk shows to KTBC Austin in 1952. WOAI in San Antonio brought East Coast comedy programming to Central and South Texas in 1928. The Majestic Theater at 713 Congress Avenue, in the shadow of our state's historic Sunset Red Granite Capitol Building, opened its doors to the world of vaudeville in 1915. Comedy in Austin is as natural as a big glass of sweet tea on a sweltering Texas evening in June. We know where we've been, and we cannot wait to see where we are going.